So recently, the news has just been full of stories about delays. Delays with the intuitive machines, delays with the Peregrine Lander, delays perhaps with Starship associated with environmental assessments, that sort of thing. And this dream of a thousand Starships making their way to the Red Planet just seems to become more and more distant as time goes on. So instead of getting mad about these sorts of things, I start to think about how could we accomplish this a little bit more effectively. Now, a lot of you folks have seen how we would land just one ship on the surface of Mars, but this is actually not a depiction of a Martian landing. It's actually a depiction of a landing on Earth, which has been just about right. Starship has been hitting terminal velocity between 200 to 250 kilometers per hour and then pulling up at the last moment and hitting the brakes. And finally, it was successful, mostly. But landing on Mars is going to be something entirely different, and this is a more recent depiction of what that's going to look like, and this is entirely different. A hyperbolic approach that makes the maximum use of the Martian atmosphere, but as you can see, at the last moment, the pull-up happens several kilometers from the surface, takes Starship up to a height of 10 kilometers, and then begins a slow descent while changing the angle of attack entirely. It's a completely different approach, and it has to be because the Martian atmosphere is less than 1% as dense as ours. As you can see, Starship is going to be going supersonic speeds at a height of only two and a half kilometers, a point where Starship has reduced its speed to anywhere between 250 and 300 kilometers per hour in the test that we've been doing thus far. I don't care how you slice this, it's going to take a lot more fuel in order to decelerate in time and to make a safe landing on a planet that has has such a thin atmosphere. So how do you accomplish all of that? And how do you choose the best landing spot? And also, how do you land on a planet that doesn't have a convenient landing pad? Well, all of those answers can actually be found here. Now, what the hell am I talking about? And how does that work in conjunction with the other partners that you've seen on the thumbnail for this video? Well, you're going to find all of that out in just a few minutes. Good morning, and welcome to yet another episode of The Angry Astronaut. So, getting more stuff on my set, as I'm sure you probably noticed in my last episode, uh, the alpaca is going to be here for some time, once again provided by Spaceship Mania. If you're interested, by the way, in how he put all of this together, I have his video linked in the description. Okay, enough about that. Uh, let's get to what I am pissed off about at the moment. You know, we talk about Moon to Mars. That is our, you know, at least NASA's big objective in this whole thing with Artemis. We want to learn how to do things at the moon, operate further away from the Earth, operate in an environment filled with cosmic rays, radiation, etc. So we want to do all of these things. And yet at the same time, our plan for going to Mars could follow a very similar pattern if we had done just one thing. 
And let me explain to you really quick what this is about. We've put the Lunar Gateway, or our intention is to put the Lunar Gateway in place to act as a base camp for our operations on the moon. A perfectly good idea, an idea made even better if we had a fuel depot there as well to resupply. So going back to Earth, going back to LEO in order to make multiple journeys to the moon will no longer be necessary as we increase our presence there. We could do the very same thing at Mars without having to build a gateway, without having to build a space station, at least not in the conventional sense. And I'm sure a lot of you can guess that I am talking, yes, about Phobos and Deimos, what I've called in the past as Mars Base Alpha and Mars Base Beta, um, depending on which one you prefer. But we really haven't done anything to explore these moons. There's been one really significant effort to try to put a probe there by the Russians, and it failed. Other than that, there's been no effort made whatsoever to determine the overall composition of these moons and whether or not they could be of use to us, and indeed, even where they came from. Even from a purely scientific standpoint, we haven't explored these things really at all. In spite of all of our missions to Mars, all of the times that we've put landers there, we have yet to explore either Phobos or Deimos. We really don't even know what they're comprised of. We can make a good guess based on their mass, based on their density, their spectrographic analyses that we've done, but those can throw us off. What exists on the surface is not necessarily what exists beneath the surface on any asteroid or any, uh, any object in the solar system. These are incredibly important things that we need to know if we want to explore the red planet. Why? Why not just go straight to Mars? And, and why is Phobos, why are they really, these two moons really that important? Well, I'm going to explain all of this to you and a comprehensive way of getting us to Mars using SpaceX and other partners right now. So let's have a closer look at this simulation. By the time Starship reaches the bottom of this descent curve, it's still going almost two kilometers per second, or about 6,000 kilometers an hour, which is the speed that just about all of the probes we've sent to Mars reaches due to atmospheric deceleration alone. In order to be able to recover and even ascend the way we're seeing it do in this particular illustration would require a hell of a burn and about 5 G's worth of deceleration. After that point, Starship begins plummeting again through the very thin atmosphere, reaching a speed of Mach 2.5 before a second burn would have to be carried out. Meanwhile, a system of LIDAR or some other type of landing system to identify the proper terrain would be utilized in order to make sure that Starship had a clear spot to land. All of this would require a substantial amount of fuel. I think that the claim here that 99% of the velocity would be bled off in the atmosphere is entirely too optimistic. The Martian atmosphere is just too thin. I'm thinking more along the lines of 95%, which means you still need a lot of fuel to decelerate this much mass that's going that fast at a couple of phases during this descent. In addition, the Martian surface is a bit devoid of the landing pads that we've had the luxury to set the Starship prototypes down on. So how do we get those there before Starship arrives? Well, the answers actually lie both in this one unremarkable moon orbiting close to the surface of Mars, and that of course is Phobos. Now, how the hell does this little moon solve all of these problems? Well, first of all, in terms of fuel. Now, we're not certain 
the surface of Phobos doesn't seem to indicate the presence of water ice. However, its density compared to its diameter and its mass seems to indicate that it could be comprised of water ice in its interior as many other moons are in the solar system. In a paper entitled Review of Water on Phobos and Deimos, there is a fair amount of magnetospheric data that suggests that water vapor is outgassing from Phobos very much as water ice outgasses from a comet, and combined with the fact that the total mass of Phobos compared to its diameter would indicate that it's made out of something that's actually less dense than water water, and obviously not as dense as rock, this strongly suggests the presence of water ice in at least some amount, and could be as much as a third of the entire moon. The paper goes on to suggest that if Phobos is a captured C-class asteroid, and this is a highly debated topic, but if it is similar to other C-class asteroids that we found throughout the solar system, it could contain as much as 2.77 trillion tons of water ice over two and a half trillion tons of water in this tiny moon, which would be enough water ice to fuel a thousand starships for decades, non-stop. In addition, given the low albedo of this moon, it suggests that it has quite a lot of carbon in its composition as well, and carbon plus the hydrogen and water plus electricity, a process called the Sabatier process, can produce methane. A lot of methane. So you have everything you need for billions of tons of methalox fuel in this moon. So why do I suggest that we not only use Phobos, but also other partners such as Dynetics and whatever this other vessel is? Well, let me explain. First of all, let's talk about how you would build a base on Phobos and how you would make use of the water ice. First of all, landing a starship on Phobos would be virtually impossible because of the tiny gravitational pull, but you wouldn't have to. Instead, what you would do is tether it to the surface and winch it down to the surface of the planet, utilizing sort of a piton and cable system as a mountain climber does in order to secure himself to the side of a cliff face. The very same principle could be used to winch a starship down to the surface in order to create a base on Phobos. The Phobos starship base would then deploy a fleet of rovers that had originally mined millions of kilograms of water ice on the moon, which is a pathetic amount compared to the amount of water ice available on Phobos. Nevertheless, the same principle would work on Phobos as had already been practiced on the moon to a great degree. And by the way, this design is complete and just needs to be built and deployed at this stage for Artemis in order to teach us how to manufacture fuel on Phobos. Each rover is powered by solar panels, which can also be recharged at the main facility, although it could also theoretically recharge at the Starship if that's where it was operating from. This is designed by the Mastin Corporation, by the way, and it weighs in at over a metric ton. It's quite sizable and moves very slowly, which would be a good idea on Phobos once again because of the extremely low gravity. Now, once again, we're having a look at how it would operate on the moon, but it could operate on Phobos in very much the same way with a few modifications. Here's a look at the rover's interior. It's designed to establish a solid seal with the regolith surface before it fires a rocket engine. Not a powerful one, mind you, but one that melts a hole into the regolith of a depth of several meters in the space of a few minutes. Obviously, on the surface of Phobos, this would have to be secured by clamps or pitons, again, something along those lines, to keep 
keep this robot from rocketing off the surface of the asteroid, but still the same principle could be applied. Once the rover has secured itself to the surface, it fires its rocket engine in short little pulses to gradually burn its way through the regolith to the ice beneath. Then the ice crystals are sucked up by what's called a planet vac, manufactured by Honeybee. That in turn is moved on to what's called an aquafactorum. Essentially this is a multi-stage process to separate ice crystals from the rest of the regolith. Now on Phobos, this could be further refined by separating carbon from the water ice and using both in order to create liquid oxygen and liquid methane. The current rover carries out this process very quickly, being capable of digging three craters per hour, each of these craters being over two meters in depth. It's quite impressive, and being able to recover 100 kilograms from each crater, so that's 300 kilograms worth of usable regolith, 85% of which is water ice, and the rest of it probably being carbon, in the space of a single hour. Imagine what a fleet of these rovers could accomplish in just a couple of days. As you may have noticed from a couple of those photographs, this robot has actually already been tested, having burned two meter craters in simulated lunar icy regolith and recovering water ice at a rate of 85% efficiency. So this can really gather quite a lot of water ice in a short amount of time. And over the course of an entire year, Look at that, 426 metric tons of ice per year from one robot. And a starship theoretically could carry as many as 80 or 90 of these things. And instead of transferring the future fuel back into the lander to be dispatched into cislunar space, the rover could instead transfer the future fuel into the starship the Starship then becoming an orbiting fuel depot on the surface of Phobos. But then how would this Starship get the fuel to another Starship on its way in? Well, that wouldn't be terribly difficult either. That Starship would not have to set down on Phobos at all. Instead, the incoming starship would just parallel Phobos' orbit around Mars, hook up to the fuel depot, or starship, whatever you want to call it, and refuel its tanks, which would be incredibly important in order for it to make a safe landing on the surface, as we've seen. Starship need not be running on nearly empty fuel tanks. Now, how would it get close to Phobos? Well, it could decelerate through the Martian atmosphere rather than landing. This process, as most of you probably know, is called aerobraking, and it's a way of reducing speed without having to use any fuel. And once again, this is all based on Elon's plan of only using five tankers in order to refuel Starship in low Earth orbit before he sends it to Mars. If Starship is expected to get to Mars in six months, it's going to have so little fuel left that it will need a refueling in order to make a safe landing. That's the whole purpose of this, plus it serves other purposes as well. Many of you have seen these maps before. They are where NASA has told SpaceX might be the best places to set up a colony. Based on the probable location of water ice, the relative closeness to the equator, and also the flatness of the terrain. However, Elon cannot be certain that these are perfect spots. It would be best to scout them out. And in comes the alpaca. Not the alpaca used on the moon, of course. It would require a heat shield, greater thrust, and a variety of other modifications. But the principle would still be the same. A smaller scout ship carrying a few astronauts down to the surface to to determine the suitability of a potential colonization spot before bringing down a starship. 
The advantages of dispatching a small scout ship from Phobos down to the surface of Mars are many fold, but the main advantage is fuel. You could dispatch a dozen alpacas down to the surface of Mars and back to Phobos for what it would take to send down one starship. And if you're not certain about where you want to establish your colony, don't you want to use the minimum amount of fuel in scouting out a location? And once you've found the location, you can also build a landing pad on site for the future Starship's visit. And personally, here's my favorite way to make a landing pad on the surface of Mars or the Moon for that matter. Two different rockets designed by the Masten Corporation again, designed to fuse together the surface of the regolith on Mars or the Moon into a hard, flat landing surface. At the same time, the alpaca crew could also put a homing beacon in place, making the landing process far more precise size for the starship in the future. This is a more involved process. It's a staged process, but it's one that involves, in my opinion, the greatest chance for success. And during their visits to Mars, the Phobos crews could establish themselves in prefabricated inflatable habitats, such as those used by the Sierra Nevada Corporation and Bigelow in the past. And as far as real-time communication is concerned, well, this is something you could do with your colleagues on Phobos while you're on the surface of Mars, determining whether or not this is going to be the ideal site for colonization in the future, plus real-time control of automated systems setting up larger habitats for future colonization. And Phobos has one other key advantage to offer. You can use a tether system from the orbit of Phobos to nearly give yourself full escape velocity. So starships on their way out can not only refuel at Phobos, they can also use its speed, <laughs> which is quite significant, in its orbit around Mars in order to propel them back home. So many advantages to this little moon, and if used in conjunction by a team of companies with the same goal in mind, Elon's dream might come true a little quicker than we ever thought. Now, a lot of you may be asking, is all of this really necessary? I mean, why do we have to go through all of these partners and this you know, convoluted process in order to effectively explore the red planet and to colonize it? Why do we have to do all this? Why can't we just use the starship? Well, I've explained some of it, obviously. You know, the, the starship, just like Lunar Starship, is not an effective scout vessel. It's just too huge. Now, if you're setting it down in a place where you're pretty certain that you can establish a colony, well, that's great. That's a wonderful thing. But are you certain about that? Because once you've deployed it, taking it back up and then landing it again is an involved process that requires a great deal of fuel. And using that enormous amount of fuel every time you need to scout a new location is just not efficient in my opinion. There are quite a number of locations on the surface of Mars that I described in the video that could serve as our ideal place to set up a colony, but we don't know enough about about these locations yet, how much better would it be for us to quickly scout out these locations before we send down our 100 tons worth of starship and 100 tons worth of cargo? Not only that, we can make the process so much safer. Again, as I described in the video, if we have a landing pad, if you have a homing beacon, if you have all of this prep 
prep work done before you have your giant ship set down or indeed before you start having a lot of giant ships set down. Just like the exploration of the moon, just like Artemis, in my opinion, it is more effective to scout out the surface with a smaller ship, a modified version of the alpaca, than it is to use the starship as a scout vessel and you can do it from Phobos and Deimos without having to build your own space station. Now, there's a lot of unanswered questions though here. Is Phobos what we think it is? Does it have a lot of water ice? Does it have a lot of carbon? These are questions that we have yet to answer. We have strong reasons to believe that they are, but we don't know. And we haven't made any effort to find out. And we don't have any plans on the books to find out yet at all. Why? If our plan is to go to Mars this soon and there are so many huge advantages to utilizing Phobos and Deimos in order to accomplish this, why haven't we done it yet? Why do we have no plans to do it in the near future? We absolutely need to look at making use of these natural space stations orbiting Mars at such a convenient distance. And, and like I say, they're floating fuel depots, quite possibly, containing not only the elements necessary for liquid oxygen, but liquid methane as well. There are huge advantages to using these if they are indeed what we think they are. But once again, we can't be certain until we explore them and until we get more information. And right now, there's no immediate plans to do so. And that, in my opinion, is a huge mistake if we truly believe in Moon to Mars. And by the way, these partners that I've talked about, Dynetics, Sierra Nevada, all of these other folks, all of them want to go, go to Mars. All of them are keenly interested in it. It's not like you'd need to talk any of them into the prospect. And there are simply some things that Starship cannot do as well as things manufactured by other companies. It's just not the perfect tool to use for every application, as I've said many times before. I think that a collaboration of private institutions can bring about Elon's dream far more swiftly, far more safely, and far more efficiently. If you like what I have to say on this channel, if you like my opinions, or even if you don't and you just like hearing a, a different take on things every now and then, it's all in the description. I could definitely use your support right now as I'm going to see not only one but hopefully two launches in Southern California in the next few days. So until we do have a comprehensive plan with the maximum chance of success of landing on Mars with the intent of not just visiting it but to set up a second home for the human species, I urge all of you to stay angry about space.